All right, so let's get started. We're coming to a tabletop position. And we'll begin moving a little bit just to warm up. So the bad news is science and medicine probably isn't going to swoop in and save the day. The good news is there's a lot we can do to empower ourselves, right? To keep ourselves in the best condition we can. And of course, one of those things is this class. So just warm up a bit and then you can tuck your toes and warm up your legs a bit. Just give everything a good, just say hello to those different muscles and joints. You know, it's early. You may not have uh, moved that much yet. I know I haven't. So just getting them used to moving a bit. And then we're going to bring the left foot forward. Okay. Now we want to bring the foot forward. The hips are as far forward and down as, as they can go safely. And then you'll notice my heel is basically under my knee. Okay. So uh, my foot's like not way back here, okay? So heel under the knee, more or less. Now here's the key step, and here's what everyone tries to avoid doing, okay? Most people wanna stay here like this, right? Uh, don't do that, you'll miss the stretch. So you want to raise your torso up and back pretty much as much as you can. So you can use blocks, you can have hands on your hips or on your knee, whatever you like. If this knee is complaining, the right knee, pat it. It's not a knee pose. This isn't like exercising your knee. Okay, it's this joint here, the hip joint that we are working and the muscles that attach to it. So today's class is a little more focused on the joint. Um, so, you know, I hope you all know <laughs> There's a difference between joints and muscle, and it's just a very slight tweak emphasis that we're making. So it's not like, you know, it's going to be a huge, oh my God, it was so different because we were focused on the joints today. It's not going to be like that, but there is a slight shift in emphasis, but I'll probably talk about both. So these are your hip flexors, muscle that we're stretching here. This is called hyperextension, okay? And um, this is what we do when we run or walk. This is what we're supposed to do when we run or walk is our leg is essentially supposed to sort of move behind us and push us forward, okay? What you'll see is a lot of modern people when they walk, they sort of lean forward in a sort of controlled fall. So they, they lean forward, a bad posture, lean forward, and then they like throw their leg out in front of them and then and pull it back underneath them. And then they throw the other leg in front and they pull it back. So they're not uh, pushing back and then stepping forward and then pushing back. It's kind of throwing their foot forward and then pulling underneath like that, okay? Um, and I'm not, I didn't come up with this. This is what, uh, some people that I follow, like uh, biomechanists that I follow, this is what I learned from them, okay? So that's where a lot of us are, partly because these muscles get really tight. Why do they get tight? Because when we're seated, this muscle is contracted. Now that wouldn't be a problem if we sat for 20, 30 minutes at a time and then got up and we were active and then we sat down again. Great, right? That would be a nice balanced, but that's not how it is for most of us. We, most of us, in order to get work done, in order to get focused, in order to get into a flow state, um, we need to stay seated for a length of time. And flow states are important. That's where a lot of the productivity actually happens for us as human beings. But the downside of it is it can be very hard on our body. All right, let's switch sides, okay? So you can come through a down dog. You could come through tabletop. I'm just gonna use tabletop today. 
Okay, so again, pretty much as far forward and down as you can go. It's, you know, you don't have to decide, you just kind of stop at a certain point. And then again, you raise yourself up. And hopefully you can see, um, my leg is kind of pushed back behind me and I'm trying to bring my torso as close to vertical as I can, because that's going to pull on my pelvis. And again, that's going to create that characteristic hyper extension. Now, while we're focused on the hips, the spine also hyper extends. Okay, so if I go into a back bend here, that's called hyper extension of the spine. The reason that's important is the hip flexors, which are stretching now, <laughs> They're called hip flexors, but they actually attach to your spine as much as they attach to your hips. Okay, that's what gives them the leverage to move your legs. Okay, if they weren't attached to your spine uh, and you try to lift your leg out in front of you, there would be no force. There'd be no leverage to pull the leg up. Right? Think of how much your leg weighs and you can just lift it up. Well, the only way you can do that is because there's all this mass up here that's creating a counter uh, balance to that, allowing you to do that, okay? So what that means for us is that this muscle uh, group is very intimately tied with the health of our spine as well as our hips and our knees. So. If you have knee pain, hip pain, back pain, um, <laughs> very often people, if their back hurts, they uh, go to the massage therapist or the chiropractor and like, my back hurts, can you crack my back? Uh, I really like the way Tom Myers puts it and my massage therapist, he's the same way. Um, usually where the pain is, the problem isn't. Usually the pain is referred from another location, from someplace else, okay? So a lot of times, um, you know, oh, I have a pain in my knee. Well, it could be your hip flexors. Oh, I have a pain in my back. Well, it could be your hip flexors, right? We might not think that a muscle at the front of my hip is going to affect my back, but it absolutely can, okay? So most of us, again, because of all the sitting that we do, most of us have some dysfunction in this muscle group. And that's what can make this such a challenging posture. Like it's very, very intense, you know, even for me right now holding this. I've been a little bit holed up for the last few days and uh, I can feel it. All right, let's go ahead and come on out of that and we'll rest for a moment before we continue. All right, we'll bring those legs in, give them a little squeeze. We're gonna shake it out a little bit. You can make circles with the knees. You can rock side to side, forward and back. All right, and the idea is just to create some balance and bring some relief. Okay, and then as we often do, we will hinge and we do this because it helps to stabilize the hips and the spine. It actually activates the muscles that we were just stretching. Okay, so stretching is great, but activating is also great. So hands under the hips, palms down, extend the legs, lift the head and neck, and lower the legs, and pop them up, and pop up to seated. Okay, I'll remind everybody that if that creates any kind of pain in your back, just try keeping your knees bent as you lift and lower the legs. That should do the trick. Okay, now we come to the half butterfly. This is called 
flexion. This is the opposite of what we're doing. So again, this is the opposite articulation. Leg out in front of us and we fold forward nice and relaxed. Okay. You don't need to flex the foot. You don't need to grab the leg. You don't need to push or pull. You can just let gravity do the work for you. Feel free to use support under the knee, the forehead, forearms, or feel free to sit on a block as well. All right, let's switch sides. So left leg, you want to feel the stretch in the back of the left thigh. Those are your hamstrings. And again, even though we're not focused on the muscles, they work very well as a proxy to let us know, um, you know, what we're doing with the joint. And they very much affect the mobility of the joint as well. So for most people in this direction, um, it isn't really the joint that's the problem. It's this muscle group here. So stretching out this muscle group, very important for the mobility of the hips.
All right, everyone. So let's go ahead and come on up and we'll make our way back and just take a moment to rebound. All right, let's bring those legs in. A little squeeze, shake it out. And again, you're sort of feeling the different sensations that are produced by the different movements and how the movements affect the sensations and what creates, again, balance, relief, Usually when the body feels good, we don't feel much, right? <laughs> it's uh, when the body's not functioning, there's pain, there's stiffness, there's soreness, there's a lot of sensation there. But when our body is just feeling good, it's like there's nothing, right? Okay, so let's continue now. Again, we'll hinge. And then we'll come into the half split. I've been struggling with this one lately. And this is a good, this is a teachable moment. Our bodies do change. And sometimes certain postures will work very well for us for a long time. And then they will stop working, whatever. I'm going to try it today. Uh, but these days lately, this has not been the best way for me personally to stretch this area. It doesn't mean it's not good for most people. I think it is for most people. All right, so we're in tabletop. We're going to take the right leg out to the right and bring our left knee away from it. Okay. Again, the foot can point, both feet can point or flex in any direction. You can stay on your hands, come down to your elbows. You can rest your torso on something. Okay. Your hips can be over the knee or press back toward the heel. Um, you have a lot of options, okay? And you wanna feel it right in here. This is the adductors, the groin, all right? And that's what we're targeting here. So again, um, this is called abduction. This is the name of this particular articulation. When you pull something, just like a good way to remember this one is think of like when you're um, abduct, right? Oh, they, they were abducted. They were taken away. Well, that's the same with your limbs. When you take your limb away from the midline of your body, I'm abducting my arm. I'm abducting my leg. The opposite of that is adduction, which is confusing because they sound so similar. <laughs> so sometimes you'll hear people say AB abduction or abduction or they might say adduction, right? So that it's a little clearer because if I say abduction, adduction, abduction, adduction, right? Do you, can you hear the difference? I'm alternating them, but they might start to sound like the same thing, but they're, they're, they're opposite. They're opposites to one another, okay? So what's interesting about that is this is abduction, abduction of the femur, which is this bone here, but these are your AD ductors, and that's what we're stretching. And that's how stretching works, folks, if you've ever been curious about how do you stretch a muscle. You stretch that muscle by bringing the bone that it manipulates in the opposite direction of what that muscle does. It's a little oversimplified because muscles don't do just one thing. Sometimes it sounds like that. Sometimes you know, doctors or physical therapists or anatomy, anatomy books try and make it sound like muscles do like, oh, this muscle does this, this muscle does that. It's not really like that. Muscles work together in conjunction to create movement. But having said that, 
yes, you can kind of create a simple map. You know, there are five muscles here. And generally, as a group, right, as a group, their job is to pull the leg in. So how do we stretch a muscle whose job is to pull the leg in? We pull the leg out, right? And we'll do the same in a moment with the, um, the muscles on the outside of the hip, right? Our abductors, we're going to stretch them by adducting the femur, the thigh bone. All right, let's switch sides. <clears throat> okay, so here we are. Again, might have to play around a little bit. I have to play around more and more these days with this one, again, because otherwise I just don't feel the stretch. This is pretty good here in this position. This isn't, <laughs> this isn't exactly how I've been doing it uh, in the past, but this tends to get right in that area. So these are very important muscles. If you hike and walk, I mean, all of your hip muscles are obviously, but um, hiking, walking a lot, these muscles get a lot of use because they stabilize the pelvis. So there's just a, a lot of use in these muscles if you're doing a lot of that kind of thing. I find a lot of people have a lot of tension, especially right in here. And emotionally, this can be a quite emotional group to stretch. For the Taoist, that's the liver channel. Um, in liver, liver gallbladder is associated with wood energy. And wood energy is the energy of kind of forward movement, growth, like vision for future. So when that gets... Um, blocked, it generally results in kind of anger and frustration and those kinds of things. So it's kind of interesting because when you stretch this muscle, people can often feel kind of frustrated and angry. Um, like, I, well, how long are we going to do this for? I hate this pose. A lot of people hate the full version of this, the full frog, like they really don't like that. But honestly, you're not doing anything harmful for your body. You're not really doing anything that you should hate. It's just a stretch. But I think it's that emotion of the, the way that it elicits that anger and that, that uh, frustration that might be there below the surface um, that people don't like. So... These things, they're designed to help us create balance and to maintain balance. And so sometimes when there isn't that balance there, when we again do a certain stretch or we do something, we're gonna have kind of an outmoded, outsized response possibly to uh, what we're doing. <laughs> have just a few more seconds here, so hang in there. All right, let's come on out of that. Make our way onto the back. Just going to relax. All right, let's pull those legs in and then we'll shake it out and do the opposite articulation, which is going to be adduction, adduction, And it will stretch the muscles that do the opposite, which is the abductors, abductors, okay? So let's hinge up. Again, the hinge is just, it's kind of something you just want to get in the habit of doing when you come up. 
It's a little tiny bit of core strength too, which most people need. Um, we do a lot more core in the uh, Monday class, but uh, especially if you're not coming to that, that's a good way to do a little bit of core. All right, so for this one, we want to essentially do that with our legs, right? We want this leg going in that direction and that leg going in that direction, all right? But that's not really that helpful. So what we do is we bend the knees. It just kind of gets the legs out of the way. And then we start to feel these muscles here, okay? Now, if this is really difficult for you, and it is for some people, then you can do it on your back. The reason it is for some people is because they don't have, usually because they don't have a lot of external rotation. All right, so you do it on your back and you can just pull the legs in and across using your arms, right? You can hold the ankles, you can hold the feet. Um, it feels good, okay? I feel the, the stretch. So I could do it like this if I wanted, but I don't because it's more work. All right, so, you know, again, for some people, you will have to put in more work in order to do the postures. It's just because of your anatomy or whatever. But my advice is don't do any more work than you need to, okay? So we come into this pose. Again, we wanna feel it in the outside of the hips there. Doesn't need to be super intense. And those are our abductors. Now, Here's the thing, we are creating a little bit of external rotation. That's just, again, it's not really practical to stretch this muscle group without a little bit of external rotation. It's just not, it's not easy, it's not practical, uh, it doesn't really make sense. And who cares, right, if we're mixing a little bit of external rotation in. But, I mention it because, again, some people struggle with external rotation, and so for those people, they might want to be on their back. That kind of minimizes the effects of the external rotation, uh, whereas with your feet on the ground, it's the feet on the ground pressing into the ground. That's what's creating the external rotation, and we're going to use that to our advantage later when we do external rotation, when we focus on external rotation, but we're just not there yet. Okay, we're focused on adduction and stretching the abductors, okay? So, um, abduction, um, adduction, again, bringing the leg out, pulling the leg in. Um, that's what these two movements are about. The first two, bringing the leg back, bringing the leg forward. So again, pretty simple stuff, not that complicated. Where it gets a little more complicated is rotation, and that's our last two sets will focus on rotation. Um, most people have, uh, their hips tend to favor either internal rotation or external rotation. Some people have very little rotation in either direction. Some people have a lot in both directions. Um, and I think a lot of times people think in terms of better or worse. Usually in yoga, people are thinking that more rotation or more flexibility is better. That's not true. Um, let's switch sides here. So again, outside of your left hip, maybe both, okay? And you come forward, just relax forward. So how can I say this? We all have a natural, optimal amount of flexibility, and that will be different for everyone. So what we'd like to do is achieve our personal maximum healthy 
flexibility. Now, I'll say that there's a range there. Okay, so if you fall below a certain level of flexibility, you're actually endangering your health. Okay, and again, this isn't my opinion. They've done studies and they've shown this stuff that a lot of times flexibility correlates with like heart health and cardiovascular health and other measures of health. Um, just to not even just to mention like mobility. When your joints um, and your limbs are stiff and they don't work, you tend to favor certain other joints and then it wears those joints out because you're you're using things to do something they weren't really designed to do because the thing that was designed to do it is broken or hurts okay so or is stiff you know it just doesn't move as much as it's supposed to move so unfortunately the way that yoga has been popularized or the the image in the media is that oh I do yoga so I'm trying to become a human Gumby um, there's no real advantage to being a human Gumby other than like impressing people on Instagram or showing off or you know being a circus act essentially you know um, being an anomaly having people like oh, wow look at what you can do but in terms of health, there's no real advantage. In fact, there can be disadvantages to having that level of flexibility. All right. So what you're looking for is just your maximum healthy amount of flexibility. The, the unfortunate thing is most of us are way below that. Most of us are in that unsafe area where our flexibility is actually so low it's impacting our health negatively okay all right let's come on out of that and we'll make our way onto our back now unfortunately uh, this is compounded as we age because as we age that process of us getting stiff and um, our joints getting stiff and all of that, that speeds up. <clears throat> so when you're young, if you do some stretching, you're probably going to maintain that flexibility for a longer period of time. Uh, when you get a little older, you might stretch a bit gain some flexibility and then you stop for a week or two and then you come back and it's like you never stretched in the first place. So it's definitely a matter of in many respects as you age, as you get older, you want to be more and more aggressive about these kinds of things because you don't have to guess what the outcome is. You can look at your average elderly person. They're not very mobile, are they? It doesn't look comfortable, does it, to be in a body like that. When you see someone who's elderly and they've got their walker or their scooter and they're just barely able to move, and you look at them, are you like, ooh, that looks like fun, that looks enjoyable? Or are you like, ooh, it's like painful just to even watch this person walk? So, again, in my perspective, unless that person got there because of, you know, injuries or disease or something like that. From my perspective, it's generally avoidable. Okay. If we, if we take care of our body, it will continue to function. All right. Let's bring those legs in. We'll stretch it out. And then we'll hinge up. Let's do a little more bear and uh, down dog again. So we're about mid, we're a little over halfway. Nice time to revisit these postures. Definitely feeling a little more mobile. 
So it's funny because as we age, and I know this because I'm aging, um, as we age, we generally feel less and less good in our body and we feel less and less good moving. So it's, it's ironic because all the scientific evidence is telling us the opposite. If you want to fight aging, if you want your body to stay healthy and strong and young, you are going to need to move more, not less. You are going to want to do more vigorous things, not less vigorous things. So we want to feel it out here. This is external rotation. Okay. At the maximum, you would pull the foot up to a right angle. Okay. If you can see that, but that's, that's only for very few people. Okay. Why am I rolled all the way over here? Because I can't do that. All right. That would break my knee. So I pull my foot back and I roll over like that. And that gives me plenty of stretch. That's the most that I get because I don't have a lot of external rotation. And this brings me to another point. A lot of times people in yoga are impressed by quote unquote open hips. And they, they're thinking of this and the other thing we did earlier, which is the abduction. That's usually what people think of when they think of open hips. They think of a lot of external rotation and they think a lot of abduction. And for some reason, they think that that's good. They're like, oh, wow, look at her. Look at what she can do with her hips. Um, unless you're a ballerina or a gymnast, I'm not really sure what advantage that gives you. In fact, again, sometimes people with that level of mobility and flexibility have difficulty not damaging their joints, not hurting themselves. They can have trouble controlling their limbs even. Okay. So, you know, what is it? I think there's an expression, something like before you judge somebody or something, you know, walk, uh, walk a mile in their shoes or something like that. You know, before you decide you want someone else's body, you might want to trade places with them for a while and see if it's as great as you think it is. So again, I know in yoga circles, very often these things are coveted as though it's so great. Oh, look at her hips. Look at how open they are, this and that. To be honest with you, it kind of disgusts me because it, there's, no, there's nothing so great about it. It's not really any better or worse. The person just has, you know, mobility in a certain direction. And so, yes, they can lay on their belly in a full split. It looks cool, but who cares? There's, there's no advantage in terms of health, right? That woman or man, if it's a man, is not healthier than anyone else. They're not any more enlightened. They're not any more spiritual. In fact, they might be the biggest jerk you ever met in your life. <laughs> they might be miserable, right? Let's switch sides. So I'm not trying to put down anyone who's flexible. If you're flexible, awesome, great. You know, use it. But I am just trying to educate because this is such a common thing in yoga where people think yoga is about flexibility and they think it's about trying to be more flexible. No, it's about trying to reach your optimal flexibility health. Okay. Your body, you could say the blueprint of your body has an optimal functioning, you might say. And there's flexibility is a part of that. And if you do not achieve that, um, again, and it's a range, I'm not saying that you always need to be like at your maximum flexibility, but again, if you start to fall too low, and many of us are, then again, it's starting to impact your health. It's starting to impact your mobility. 
it's starting to impact your quality of life. And again, because many of us, when we're young, we don't really think about that and we're relatively flexible when we're young. Um, by the time we start to notice, oftentimes, I won't say it's too late because it's never too late. A lot of times, a lot of damage has been done. Now, why is that important? The reason it's important is because it's a lot harder to undo damage than it is to simply not create it and to maintain health. Okay? I hope that makes sense. It's much easier to maintain health than it is to damage your health and then reverse it. Okay? So that's why that's important. So some of you in this uh, meeting, are you're pretty young. And so I hope you will take these principles and use them for the rest of your life. And then you will, you will never have to kind of reverse the effects of, you know, having neglected your health or your body, um, you know, later in life, because that's where many people are. They, they kind of let things go. No one said anything about, you know, flexibility being important or, uh, diet being important or whatever it is. And so they just figured, oh, well, you know, I do whatever I like, right? Um, and then, you know, something, the wheels come off, <laughs> so to speak. You end up going to the doctor or whatever. You find out, you know, these things are happening to you. And, um, you know, at that point, you're then trying to reverse things. And unfortunately for us in this country, most of the ways the doctor will try and reverse it is through very, very uh, extreme measures, extreme um, interventions. So surgery, drugs, these are pretty extreme. All right, let's unwind from that. We have one more articulation, but let's rest first. <clears throat> So that's one place where Western medicine really, really strives. If you're, you know, interested or you're, um, you know, wondering about Western medicine is very, very good at what my doctor friend calls crisis intervention. So when you are in crisis, Western medicine is very good at coming in, swooping in and saving the day. So if you have a limb that's off of your body, as far as I know, no amount of acupuncture or acupressure or yoga or Ayurvedic herbs is going to put your limb back on your body. But guess what? A good surgeon with the right tools may be able to save your limb. Like that's amazing, right? So I'm not, I never want anyone to hear me and think that I'm devaluing Western medicine or Western techniques, because it's amazing. But that's kind of like a sledgehammer, right? That's like an extreme case, and you're just like, whack. So that's Western medicine, very good at that. In terms of like just maintaining, we don't need a sledgehammer. We don't need the, you know, big whatever, just maintaining our health. Generally speaking, and again, I have friends who are doctors and nurses, and they agree. Generally speaking, in terms of maintenance, keeping all of this running, Western medicine, not so good. Okay, the more subtle stuff, the more daily stuff, not so good. All right, let's bring the legs in, give them a little squeeze, shake it out. And then we'll hinge up. So again, a lot of us, we, we, I think, have been habituated in this country to just wait for the wheels to come off. We don't do anything to take care of our health, and then something goes wrong, and we go to the doctor because now we are in crisis, and we want the doctor to fix it, right? But that's really not how health is maintained. Health is maintained through things like this. We're not doing anything mind-blowing here. We're just moving our hips around. Wow. But that adds up over time. 
that makes a huge difference over time. Okay, this one might be the most challenging one for certain folks. This is internal rotation, okay? So at the minimum, it looks kind of like that. The foot is right up next to the hip. Okay, you can sit on something, you can change the angle of the knee. You can even bend this knee and kind of roll away from the hip, okay? Now, what we want to do is rotate this. This is your femur again. This is what we're manipulating. The way I manipulate my femur, rotate it, is with this, the tibia, okay? So the further my tibia comes from my hip, the more rotation I get. Now again, the maximum would look like that, but I can't do that. I mean, I could sit here like this, but my hip is off the ground, right? So I, I'm not getting, again, any advantage by having my leg in this position. So I just pull that leg back right about here. I'm not straining the knee, not straining the ankle. And I don't feel much in the hip either, but I know that this is my limit, okay? So I could just stay there like that if I wanted, but there's a nice stretch in the front of the thigh. If I lower back, I can generate that stretch, okay? And that's the half saddle. I'm gonna put this leg in this position because that just feels better for me. All right, so again, we are internally rotating the hip. A lot of people get confused because they, they because they don't know about anatomy, and they think, well, internal, your foot's out at the side. I'm not rotating my foot. I'm rotating this, okay? And this is rotating in that direction, in. Okay, so remember that. When we talk about internal and external rotation, we're not looking at the foot, not looking at the lower part of the leg, we're rotating this. Okay, the femur. So what direction is it rotating in? It is rotating in. This is internal rotation. Now I have quite a bit of internal rotation. Some of you at home might be like, oh, that's kind of gross. Like, how does he do that? That looks weird. Um, some people, if you saw them in this position, it would mean that their leg was broken or their hip was broken, their knee was broken. Um, and this is what I was talking about earlier, that in a sense, I have very open hips, just not in an external rotation or a lot of abduction. So again, for whatever reason, I think because this just doesn't look so appealing, right? It's not like, ooh, look how pretty that is. So again, there's just these certain positions for whatever reason, when we see someone splayed on their belly with their legs straight out to, so to the sides, and we look at that, we think, ooh, pretty. Wow, impressive, right? And so then we immediately think like, oh, this is something that I need to do, or this must be what yoga is about. So it's not. <laughs> it's not important. It's not healthy uh, or any healthier than anything else. Um, it doesn't make any difference. And then, you know, something like this, where you might have a lot of internal rotation, you might be thinking, oh, well, who cares about that? That's not pretty. Well, if you like skiing, you absolutely have to have good, if you like downhill skiing, okay? Not cross country, downhill. That's how you do the that movement, right? You both, femurs move together. If you don't have that, one of your legs will not move with the other and you will tear up your knee. And I met a woman who was at one of my teacher's trainings and she loved to downhill ski and she did not have a lot of internal rotation. And I think she had had three knee replacements. Let's switch sides. So it's important to remember that our bodies are different and those differences do impact what we can do safely, what we cannot do safely. Um, 
And we really don't want to put yoga, make yoga something that is going to be injurious to us, right? So again, if I'm downhill skiing, I'm trying to force my knee. If I don't have a lot of internal rotation and I'm downhill skiing, I'm trying to force my knee to do something that biologically, it's just my particular body, it's not designed to do, okay? Again, skiing every now and then, whatever, for fun, it's fine. But you know, if you love it and you're skiing all the time and all this stuff, yeah, you're gonna tear up your knees, okay? And the same is true for many professional sports and professional athletes and things like this, you know. Not everyone can be a ballerina. You have to have a certain amount of natural build. And then it takes a lot of hard work on top of that. All right? Same with like being a competitive lifter or uh a professional swimmer. Um, most things, when you get to that level, it requires, you know, so much kind of specialization that really um, certain body types, if again you force it, you try and force it, you'll actually just end up hurting yourself. You won't become, you know, some kind of a superstar or whatever. You're just going to end up injuring or hurting yourself. So we don't want yoga to be like that, is my main point, which is why each of these postures and all the postures we do on Monday, they can all be adapted to be done in a way that is safe for your body. We may need to tweak things a little bit. We may need to have a conversation, you and I, one-on-one. -on -one. You know, I may have to look at some things and we may need to talk back and forth, but all these things can be adapted to your body, okay? So you're not trying to force a square peg into a round hole because you don't need to do that. There's no advantage to doing that. You're not benefiting yourself in any way. All right, let's go ahead and unwind from that one. Let's rest. So we all have these six movements in our hips, okay? We all have some, even if it's very limited, we all have some extension, flexion, abduction, adduction, internal rotation, external rotation. And all we were trying to do today is just to use whatever we've got. Now, if we have very limited uh, motion because we haven't stretched much and our muscles are tight. If we keep doing that over time, the muscles will relax, the soft tissues will change and we will gain in flexibility. And eventually we will hopefully reach our, again, we'll get in that range, that healthy range of flexibility and mobility where we want to be. Um, but it's certainly not our objective to just continue getting more and more and more and more flexible. Um, there's really no advantage to doing that. All right, let's bring our legs in, give them a little squeeze, shake it out. And then we'll set the timer for six minutes, right? And just rest for that time. <laughs> 